Amen. Y'all can have a seat. And good morning. <laughs> I was trying to think of a, an intro video to maybe play, and I thought I told Karen this morning. I said I need to find one that has like a, a bunch of people yawning. Because <laughs> I was back in my office and I couldn't stop. And I'm like, come on. I just kept drinking Mountain Dew. So come on, wake up. You can't. But it looks like most of y'all survived the time change overnight. Y'all made it here. I'm so excited about that. Um, isn't it amazing what one hour, how just one hour can just sort of mess up everything? I mean, maybe not just today, but for some of us, it's going to take all week. It's going to take all week to get used to the sun not being up when we get up and, to, and trying to go to bed and try to go to sleep with the sun still shining. It's, uh, it's just, and we, it's because we don't like change. We don't like anything that just that changes our schedule. We don't like anything that doesn't fit into our plans. We don't like anything that, that, that just doesn't fit anymore. It's all been messed up. So I wanted to ask this question today. Have you ever, have you ever had a, a, a prayer that was unanswered? It, it just never got answered, or it, not when you wanted it to, or not when we needed it to be answered. You ever had that, that happen? Have you ever been, you know, confused about God's response? You ever been frustrated? Ever get angry because of God's delay? And you didn't receive the answer that you were wanting. Have you ever got to that place in your life? And if I think we're honest, I think every single one of us at one time or another could probably be put in that category. There was something that we prayed, it just didn't happen. There was something that we wanted to happen, and we asked God for it, and it just didn't happen. And I believe this happens really more often because of our individual and our corporate relationship with God. We expect Him to do certain things individually or as a church, and, and He doesn't. And it, it begins to not make sense. It, it does, we, we're not happy about it, we're disappointed in it, uh, we're confused, we get angry. It, it, it's not fitting into our plans. This relationship is not fitting in our plans. It's not fitting into our schedule. It's not going exactly how we wanted it to go. Because we all go through situations. We all go through circumstances that we need God to do something. And we'll cry out to him to, to do something in our life. But it seems like he's not paying attention. We get upset sometimes because it feels like God is not giving us any attention. And his, his lack of understanding, his lack of even, he's indifferent. And it, it, it was like, are we being ignored here? Are we, not, are, are we not significant enough to where God would do something in our lives? And we know better than that because we talked about that last week. And then we get confused because we're, we're upset with God. And how am I supposed to respond? If God doesn't answer my prayer, if God doesn't come through when I want him to come through, how am I supposed to respond? Or should I even respond at all? Should I even say anything at all? It puts us in the, what I would consider like a rock and a hard place because this is God and, and we expect him to do something, but he's not. So how do we, do we, do we fuss at him? And, we, or we, and it's, it puts us in a dilemma. It's called a divine dilemma. And it's not anything new. It's not like we're experiencing it for the first time. This has been going on for hundreds of years, even thousands of years. When we open the Bible and we start to read about our heroes of faith in the Bible, we start to see how when they were frustrated about an unanswered prayer, that God didn't do things like they were hoping God would do, we, we look at their response and how they handled it through their frustration, through their anger, through their disappointment. I mean, in fact, when, when we look at the life of Job, when you look at the life of Job, he's lost his family, his fortune. I mean, it's, it's, it's all gone in, in Job chapter 30. And this is what he says. This is his response to God in Job chapter 30, verse 20. I cry to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. I'm right here, God. I'm right. I'm at church every Sunday. I tithe 10% faithfully i serve i'm on a ministry team i attend a connection group i'm right here and you're not even looking at me this is job or us whichever way you want to look at it and then there's king david he gets tired of all this running and hiding to get away from his enemies and he says this in psalm 22 my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me why are you so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Then after their brother dies, 
uh, Lazarus dies, Mar Martha and Mary, they basically say the very same thing to Jesus in, in John chapter 11. One speaks in verse 21 and one speaks in verse 32. They say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he, we, go through, we go through this whole thing in the Bible, and we're, and we're reading, and we see this. It happens in several different places, and it happens in our lives. It's like it never, it's like you talk to people and say, well, God didn't do this. So I, it, how, here's the question for today. How do we respond when we don't feel like God is responding to us? What are we supposed to do when it feels like God is not answering, when God's not paying attention and God doesn't hear us, when he's not answering our prayers, when, when, when he seems to ignore us and he seems so far away from us, it's like we're here alone. I mean, do we cry out like Job and David? Where are you? Or do we, are we more sad and hurt like Martha and Mary? Where were you? This was going on, and where were you through all of this? Do we walk away from God? Do we just shut down the relationship, cut him off? Blame God for everything that's happening. You're giving the silent treatment. Well, how do you give God the silent treatment? Well, you just stop praying. And you stop praising. You stop going to church. You stop giving. You stop serving. It's done. And maybe these are ways, or maybe these are some of the familiar ways we respond in some of our relationships with people that we know. And we, we request, we, we make a request of them, but we don't like their answer. You know? And so we just shut them off. We just walk away and say, all right, you're not going to come through on this. You're not going to do, you didn't answer it the way I wanted to answer it. You didn't do what I wanted you to do, so I'm done with you. But it, see, it really gets complicated when we realize that we're, we're actually, we're, we actually, we're having this point of frustration and we have this point of anger with the creator of the universe. When we realize that we're, we're upset with God, it makes things a little bit more complicated because, and, and, you know, we don't want to admit it. And I think that's part of the complication. Because we know on some level that God can. He can. He can give sight to the blind. He can help the lame to walk. The mute to speak. And the deaf to hear. He can do all things. So why is he not fixing my problem? Why is he not answering my prayer? When I, why is he not doing this for me? How am I supposed to respond when there's a God that can do anything, but he's not doing anything for me? What I want to do today is I want to share three practical ways on how we can respond when we're frustrated, when we're upset, when we're angry, when we're disappointed, when we're confused, when we're hurt, when we're sad, with God's answers. Whether we get those answers or not, how do we respond? Three practical ways. And the first one is this. When you learn how to wait on God. Just wait. I know that's not a very popular answer to wait. We're not people that like to wait. But waiting is a powerful, a powerful way to respond. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, he says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. What he's talking about is we're trying to understand God's plan and God's purpose for our life. And it's not making sense and it's not lining up and it's not fitting into our plans and into our schedule. He says it, it, it'll tire you out trying to second guess God and trying to figure out God is going to wear you out. Even as far as to say young men, young men, those new believers, those on fire believers, those fired up and do anything, nothing can stop them. They'll get tired trying to figure out God and God's plan and purpose if they're not paying attention. They'll, they'll be exhausted trying to figure out what God is doing and what God can do. But those, those who respond with patience that our society doesn't have, but those who respond with patience, who wait on God, will find their strength renewed. He continues and says, they will mount up with wings like eagles, meaning they will rise above the pain and the disappointment and the struggles. And they, they, they shall run and not be weary, that they will endure whatever comes their way, and they shall walk and not faint. They will persevere through anything that's going on. How many of us ever feel weary 
and tired of waiting. We don't like to wait. It's hard to wait. It's especially hard. It's even hard to trust God sometimes. It's hard to place things in his hand and let him have control. It's hard to trust him that he's going to answer our prayer. When we have, especially when we have our enemy, Satan, constantly trying to tell us and remind us, he hasn't answered your prayer yet, so he's probably not going to do it. You're not important enough. Your request is not significant enough. You don't do enough. You're not good enough. And, that's, and he'll start telling us, and we'll think, we can't wait. We don't like to. We, we live in a society and, and, a, and a culture that, that impatience is the norm. I mean, you used to be able to go to the burger places. You used to go inside and order your burger and go sit down and eat. Well, now that took too long, so they put in drive throughs because we don't like to go in. We don't like to get out of the car. We don't want to go inside. We just want to drive up. We're going to order. And now, did you realize that drive throughs are not, the drive throughs now are too slow? So we ordered online. And we pay for it so we can just walk in and grab it and leave. Not talk to anybody. Don't place the order. Don't say, what did you say? No, no, I don't know what you said. Yeah, that, give me that one. No, we, we, we do it online. You ever notice that? They, they walk in. You, you walk into Starbucks and all the coffees are lined up there, but there's nobody in. Who are these for? Well, I'll take one. No, it's not yours. And somebody just walks in, grabs it, and goes back out. Never says, hey. Never says, thank you. Because we don't have time to stop. We can't wait on anything. We, we order everything. <laughs> y'all, y'all order stuff online, don't you? <laughs> y'all don't even go to the grocery store anymore. They bring it out to you, don't they? Man. Just open the trunk. You, you push the button, the trunk opens, they put it in, shut it, and you drive off. Or if you're not watching, you back into their cart. I don't know. But <laughs> been there, done that. We just don't like to wait. What you what need to understand is wait actually means time adjustment. And that's what waiting is, is adjusting your time. And we don't have time for this. We don't have time for that. We don't have time for God. So I, I, I really want to have some good news to share with you here that, that waiting on the Lord doesn't necessarily mean you need to sit still and stop moving. Because I don't want to sit down. I don't want to stop. I'm a constant motion. That's, that's my nature. That's, that's our society. That's our culture. Don't stop. No. But we need to wait. We need to adjust our time for God. Even if, even if we're frustrated, even if we're confused and we're angry because God hasn't answered our prayer the way we wanted it answered, or we just haven't heard anything from Him. So we wait. And the best way to wait is to walk with God. If you really want to wait on God, walk with Him. Spend some time with him. I mean, but, but don't wander off. Don't, don't, don't go look for another way to answer your prayers. To take care of what you need. Walk with him. Spend some time with him. This is so well illustrated in, in, in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 5. Um, Mark, chapter 5, starting in verse 22. It's another one of those familiar passages of Scripture that we get drawn into. And the more we get drawn into it, the more we learn from it. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So, so Jesus went with him. They began walking. Walking. A large crowd followed. Walking. Walking. And pressed around him. A large crowd is going in the same direction that Jesus and this guy are walking. You're in a church, and the church is going in one direction. You feel like this is where God has planted me. We're all going in this direction. So we're all walking in the same direction. We're, you know, so what we're learning here is there's a man named Jairus. And he has traveled to find Jesus. And he has made his request to Jesus to come and take care of his daughter. And Jesus and Jairus are walking. They're walking together to go take care of his daughter to answer Jairus' request. However, as they begin their journey, as they begin walking together, a woman comes to Jesus and interrupts their journey. She interrupts their walking together. They're no longer moving now. They've stopped. And she has had a lifelong illness miraculously healed on the spot. 
right then. Everything just stops for this woman. All while Jairus is waiting. Counting the seconds. Counting the minutes. Breathing in and breathing out his daughter's name. As Jesus tends to other needs. If you were this father, if you were this parent, would you be starting to get a little antsy right now? I mean, but honestly, as a parent, as a father of a sick child, and Jesus is supposed to be coming with you, you know what he's thinking. What about my request? What, what, what about, what, aren't we, are, are, we, are we still going to go heal my daughter? This was my request. I was here first. She came later. Is she more important than my daughter? She's going to die, Jesus. What are, you, what are you doing? We were walking. And then the unthinkable happens in verse 35. While Jesus, no, while Jesus was still speaking. So this lady that has, has touched him and she's been healed, Jesus is carrying on a conversation with her. And Jairus is like, why are you talking? And Jesus is still speaking to another person that, that needed help, that interrupted the, the walk to his daughter. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? He can't help you now. You're needed at home. You can't wait any longer. Go on without him. He's not, he's not continuing to walk with me. I can't even fathom what this father is dealing with right now. What he's even thinking. What's going through his mind at all. But then in verse 36, overhearing what they said, in some translations is ignoring what they said, and some is disregarding what they said. Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. And they continue walking. From that point, they continue walking on to Jairus' home where Jesus performs another miracle. He took the little girl by the hand, had her stand up, and rescued her from death, from the grave. Now, I want you to see something that happened. Maybe you haven't noticed this. That Jairus, the father, had to literally walk with Jesus for 18 verses before his request was answered. 18 verses. Well, that's not much. much. 18 verses aren't just 18 verses. We don't know how far that walk was. It could have been half a day. When he first met Jesus and said, Come, they, this 18 verses could have taken a couple hours just to walk. Because it doesn't say that Jairus lived right there because he came to Jesus. It doesn't mean he lived around the corner. He knew where Jesus was, where did travel, got out where Jesus had traveled. He, he, he traveled to meet Jesus. So now he's got to walk all the way back to his house. And they've been interrupted, had to wait and stop. There's no telling how long he's had to wait. There's no, no telling how long they, did Jesus and his lady talked. Only a certain amount is recorded. But he, for 18 verses, he had to watch. He had to watch as Jesus stopped and helped somebody else. Think about this. He's coming with me to help somebody. I mean, now he's stopped and he's going to help somebody else. And the whole time they're waiting, his, his daughter has died in the process. The life doesn't always go the way we want. It doesn't always fall into place like we want it to, or like we think it's going to. Our prayers, our requests, our cries for help aren't always answered on our timeline. 
They're not. Sometimes we just need to keep walking with God. Not without Him, but with Him. Not away from Him. And while we're walking, just wait. Wait for the answer to come. Might not be the answer we want. But we continue walking. So there's, there's, there's a response of waiting for God. And while we're waiting, let's walk with God. Not get away from Him. Spend more time with Him. And the third response. We need to worship. We just need to worship. Uh, as believers, we are a people of praise. Read through the Bible. Followers of Jesus are people of praise. Uh, the Israelites in the wilderness praised God. They would sing songs about God and their freedom. They complained, yes, but they always sang songs about worshiping God for who He is and what He had done for them. Followers of Jesus worship God for what Jesus did for them, saved them, and they always praise Him. They always find a way. We are people of praise when we're as believers, and we have a Creator anxiously waiting to hear and receive our worship. He's wanting to hear us worship Him. No matter how frustrated we are, no matter how confused we are, no matter how angry we are, no matter how hurt we are, because He's still God. We can't discount that. When, when King David was, was trying to process the whole idea that I'm king and they're chasing me and I'm hiding from these people, he was... He, he, he lifts up this collective cry called the Psalms, a collective cry of help to God, a collective cry to worship God, even while he's hiding. Job, Job has lost everything. And when you go back and read the account of what happened in the first chapter in verse 20, Job chapter 1 verse 20 says that Job got up and he tore his robe and he shaved his head. He is in total grief of what has happened, that he's lost everything and he's lost his family. He, he shaved his head and then it says, then he fell to the ground in worship. David's being chased all over the place and worships God. Job loses everything and worships God. Choosing to worship God in any situation, choosing to worship God in any circumstance is a powerful response of belief and trust in God. So we have to ask ourselves, did, did, did Job and King David know something about worship we don't? That it's more than just singing songs? It's the power, the power of worship, the blessings we receive through worship. Hillsong United had a song out recently or a while back. Not recently, but a while back. It's called Even When It Hurts. The title of the song is Even When It Hurts. And I want to share with you some of the words from that song. Even when my strength is lost, I'll praise you. Even when I have no song, I'll praise you. Even when it's hard to find the words, louder than... I'll sing your praise. Even when everything is falling apart all around us, when life is not going the way that I think it should go, God, when I'm not getting the answers that I really wanted to get by a certain time that I needed the answers, God, I'm still going to praise you because you're God. C.S. Lewis had a quote, and this is what he said. It is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to men. Does that mean he doesn't show up when we're crying? No, it doesn't mean that. Does, does that mean he doesn't show up when I'm hurt and I'm, I'm, I'm asking for his? No, it doesn't mean he doesn't show up. But when we worship him in whatever situation ever in, he's going to communicate with us. He's going to speak to us. And y'all know, y'all know what, we're, what I'm talking about here, and you know the quote is true. Because there'll be a song that we, Matt will be leading up here and the, and the ladies will be singing or Matt will be singing and everything just, and you're just drawn into the song and everything else disappears. It's the power. What, what if, well, just think about it. What if our worship actually does bring us closer to God? Could we possibly get even closer? Well, yeah. What, what if our worship actually brings us so close to into His presence we can sense Him? What if worshiping God actually brings us closer to his answers to our requests that we so desperately seek? 
instead of complaining and crying and shutting him off. Have we stopped singing? Have we stopped praying? Have we stopped praising God because we're too hurt and too tired, too confused, too ticked off because we don't think God's going to answer? See, I can't answer those questions for you. Those are questions we all have to answer on our own. But I can encourage you that worship is a powerful and effective response when we're feeling frustrated and confused and angry and hurt. This journey called life is not an easy one. It's very difficult. And I would recommend that you keep the music turned up along the way. You ever, you, you, anybody got those playlists that you like to have? You just put certain songs. It's called a playlist, and you use them for specific times. Uh, last month, we had this Valentine's event for couples, and I sent out an email to all the couples and said, hey, send me a song that takes you and your wife back. That, that, that was your song. And we, we had a list of songs, man, and we played those songs. During the night, they would hear these songs over and over and over. From songs from the wedding, songs from when they were dating, Summer Place, things like that. Andy Williams. <laughs> I don't, me, me, y'all, some of y'all don't know who that was. Um, uh, Chicago, uh, Burt Bacharach. No, I don't know that one either. Uh, you know, just, just these songs. And, and you would, it, was a, it was just so cool to watch as you played those songs. Every, everything just sort of changed in the room. The people that you were talking to, they would stop talking and, ah, ah, that, that's our, they, they, they put our song up there. Those playlists. You know, some people use them when they exercise. If they really want to burn some calories, they go, da, 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 da. it's going in their head all the time. If you just want to relax, if you just want to sit and relax, you've got a certain playlist. If I could just listen to this and just chill. It's just a playlist. What would our waiting on God playlist sound like? What would our walking with God playlist sound like? I'm not sure what yours would sound like. I mean, it's up to you to put those songs that will take you there to help you wait and to help you walk, to help you worship. But I would hope those songs would help you focus on the greatness the faithfulness, the everlasting love that God has for you as his child. Because he would never leave you. He would never walk away from you. He would never turn his back on you. He's always right there. So I, there's these, these, three, these three practical ways to respond, the waiting and the walking and the worshiping, that's not the complete list. There's dozens, dozens of responses that we can have Positive and negative. When our prayers seem to go unanswered. But the question comes down, do I, do I trust God in his response to my request? Do I trust him? Does it come down to, do I, do I trust God? Do I still believe that God is who he says he is? Do I still believe in God's promises? In John chapter 11, we read this miraculous story of Lazarus, who Jesus called back out of the grave after he'd been dead for four days. I mean, this is undoubtedly one of, if not the most incredible, powerful miracles performed by Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. But this miracle was also preceded by confusion and sadness, disappointment and anger. Because Mary and Martha... They didn't like the way Jesus didn't respond. He, he didn't respond when they thought he should. He didn't show up when they wanted him to. While, while Lazarus was sick, I even told you earlier that they both said, Lord, if you'd been here, our bro my brother would not have died. I mean, even when you read the story in John 11, his disciples are saying, well, Jesus, you know he's dying. You know he's sick. Why aren't we rushing right over? He said, no, no, no. This sickness is not going to lead to death. This is going to be a chance for God to glorify his son through this. It's going to be something that I'm going to do that God has set up that I'll do this to bring glory to me for who I am and how people can trust me no matter what happens in their life. 
And while those on the inside of the situation, those who are right there in the midst of it, those who are watching Lazarus get sicker and sicker and watching Lazarus die, and there's nothing they're confused, they they're just confused and frustrated that Jesus doesn't show up, but God is on the outside of the situation, seeing the big picture of the situation and puts into motion what we call Romans 8.28. Working all things together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. See, those on the inside, they have to wait. Those on the inside have to continue to walk. And those on the inside are expected to worship and, and ultimately trust God as, a, as who he is. But Jesus knew all along what God was doing. Do I still believe that God does that? Do I still trust him? That way, will I continue to wait on him? Will I continue to walk with him? Will I continue to worship him and trust him as the Lord of lords and King of kings? Because if I do that, you need to know, I want to encourage you, he is working in your situation. He is doing something in your situation, in your circumstance that you don't see right now because you're too close to it. You need to give it to him so he can look at it from the outside and say, this is what I want to do. Because he's for you. He's not against you. You're his child. He gave his son for you. He's, he doesn't really want to disappoint anybody. He wants to bless his children. But in his time. In his time on his schedule. So I want to encourage you. Keep waiting. Keep walking and keep worshiping. No matter what comes your way. This Friday evening... A movie, uh, March the 13th, a movie, a, a faith-based movie is going to be released all across the country. It's I Still Believe. And it takes what we just talked about today, what's written here in the Bible, what we discussed today, and it puts it up on the screen. And a, a, a true story of hurt and suffering, and joy and love. And I saw it last year in a preview showing. I'm going to go see it again this week. That's how good this movie is. And, and, and what we're doing with this series, I still believe, bookends the movie. I mean, it, it doesn't mean it's just going to last for one day. It's going to be in the theaters for a week, depending on the response. And then from what I saw and what I remember about it, it's going to be there for quite a while. Because it, it takes everything that we just talked about and all the prayers, and it makes it modern day, real time. And you'll... you'll I just, I, I just encourage you, find a time to go see that movie because it is filled with responses from individuals that you'll get to know on how God, their responses to God's answered prayers and their response to God's unanswered prayers. It, you just, you'll just be, this will be like a little exclamation point that will, the notes you took today and what you heard today and what you can go back and listen to on our website and send the notes to yourself. Or whatever. I'm just telling you, if you really want to add a little bit more, just to get a, a closer picture of what's going on in someone's life, because I know a lot of you have been there, and you'll see everything again, and you'll realize that God is in control, that God is this incredible miracle worker in strange ways that we don't always see, because like I said, we're too close sometimes. Wait on God, walk with Him, and worship Him. Let's pray. God, I do thank you so much for your word and how it challenges us. The, I, I, personally, God, I know there's times that I, I've, prayed, I've prayed for certain things to happen in a certain way at a certain time, and it didn't. And I just, I'll just be honest. I, yeah, I've been upset. And I know there's people in the room that it feels like, well, you didn't, you didn't hear my prayer. Yes, you did. You just see it from a, a different point of view. We're too close to the situation sometimes. We need to separate ourselves from the situation a little bit and, let you, and allow you to take care of it. God, it hurts when I know families have, have lost a loved one, when someone's dealing with a sickness, when a loved one's given just a certain amount of time to live.
when a marriage falls apart. When something happens to a child. And we're beaten to the core. But if we would just wait on you. If we'd stay with you. Focused on you. Walking with you. Through everything. Worshipping you. Because you're still God. Worshiping you because you allowed your son to save us. To give us hope. And we'd sing your praise of how great you are, how faithful you are, and how much you love us, God. That's, that's our heart cry this morning, God. Help us. To what we can say, I still believe. No matter what happens in my life, God, I still believe. I trust you, God. I'm placing everything in your hands, turning it all over to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.